Hi, everyone, and welcome to a live chat with Nurse Linda. Linda Schultz is a leader and provider of rehabilitation nursing for over 30 years and a friend of the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation for close to two decades. Just a quick note before you view the webinar recording, we did have some technical difficulties and the recording cut off the first few minutes of the webinar. With that being said, today Nurse Linda is talking about the bladder. Let's get started. Um, some people, if they, if, if urodynamic testing says you have a low pressure bladder, they might teach crede or Vesalva. Crede is a way of rolling your hands over the bladder on the outside of the skin. And that um, can drain it or Valsalva that bearing down and that sometimes helps. But you don't wanna just try that. You wanna be sure and be tested because if you do those techniques and you don't have a low pressure bladder, you've just ruined your kidneys. So you have to be very careful about these things. It's, it's, not, um, it's not a kind of thing where you just, oh yeah, I'm gonna try this. I mean, this is, this is serious. This is big time business. So you wanna make sure that you're safe at all times because you only have these kidneys and once they're gone, you know, that's trouble. Um, so here it says that um, somebody had, a friend had the mitra fan off and she loves it. Um, and she's, and this person's planning to have one as well. So, you know, that mitra fan off, you know, I, I sound like I'm rah rah, but it is a surgical procedure. And there are difficulties sometimes with people who have spinal cord injury and breathing and having surgical procedures. But, you know, if you think it might be for you, get the information and learn about it. Talk to your healthcare professional about you. What you hear from your neighbors, from your friends, from other people in the community, that might work for them, but there might be something unique to you. So always be sure and talk and ask about that. Um, so the next question is about somebody who has anxiety and stress to affect emptying the bladder successfully and what can you do? So um, if you have a neurogenic bladder and you're doing catheterization, the catheter is going to do take the urine out because that's, just, you know, that's what it does. So if you have emotions like, oh, I, I'm uncomfortable doing this catheterization, um, think about other ways. I know a lot of men uh, really have problems with putting the catheter in the penis that just, just freaks them out. Um, it's something that you have to get used to. It's, it's just, you know, it's the treatment, it's the intermittent catheterization is the best of all the treatments because it mimics the natural action of the catheter. Not everybody can do it, but if you can, that's something. So if you're having anxiety, talk to a therapist, you know, use your resources, talk to your healthcare professional, talk to a therapist to help you reduce your anxiety um, because, you know, this is just a part of having it. You know, some people, uh, have spinal cord injury and you say, well, this is the way you have to empty your bladder and they don't like it, but they go ahead. Uh, some people never get adjusted to it and they have to have maybe an indwelling or they have to have a super pubic just because of um, their own feelings about catheterization. 80% of people are somewhere in the middle of that. So if you are a little bit anxious or, you know, have a little bit of uh, difficulty in getting the catheterization done, be sure and use your um, resources and talk to somebody about that because it's just something that, you know, it's the way that now things work. It's normal for you. So that's, you, that's what you have to get to that point. Um, the next person has two spinal cord injuries and a survivor. And you know what? Everybody listening who has a spinal cord injury is a survivor. If you're new, if you've had one for a long time, you're a survivor of spinal cord injury. That's something to be proud of. Um, this person does walk, but he has some uh, deficits and he's got irritable, irritable bowel and he's had a, a long line of um, a long line of issues. So what else can I do? Um, so probably uh, what he, what you need to do is to get some neurodynamic testing with a double spinal cord injury at two different places. I'm assuming at two different times uh, because it's at uh, C3, 4 and C5, 6, which would be all together at one, that would be one spinal cord injury session episode. 
if the injuries were at one time and then an issue was at another time, that would be two. So get that urodynamic testing because it's, it's um, if you're having trouble emptying your bladder that is taking up so much time in your life, you need to find out ways. And there are all different ways as I've outlined many of the ways um, that you can use to empty your bladder. So you'll need to find something if you've been trying to do it by straining or, or something else that, uh, you know, that could be a problem for your kidneys at that level of injury. So if it's just difficult in voiding, there are even some medicines that can kind of help uh, control the sphincter that can loosen it a little bit, but not too much that might overpower that. But you need to look and make sure that you don't have a high pressure bladder. Um, oh, somebody writes in straining can also cause hernias and they sure can. They can also cause a uh, prolapse of the rectum if you're trying to strain. So you need to know how far you can go on some of this stuff. And if it's so much straining that you're running into other problems, then maybe straining to go to the toilet is not the answer for you. If it's causing backup into your kidneys, that's not the answer for you. So you'll need to try some of these other strategy strategies. The next is a lady who has paraplegia and she uses the speedy cap, uh, but she's been having recurrent UTIs. And so she's, she's tried everything, it sounds like. So um, this, uh, this is the thing about uh, urinary tract infections. They do come from bacteria, so we know that. But how the bacteria gets there is another thing. So women are more prone to urinary tract infections because um, of the anatomy. Things are all there in the same mucous membrane all together. Men still are prone to urinary tract infections um, because you know everybody passes gas, men and women. You might not feel any uh, leakage, you might not see any leakage, but sometimes there is a little bit and it gets in the urethra. Another thing that happens is um, that sometimes when people clean their urethra before they catheterize, they use soap and water or they use a, a betadine or some kind of cleaning, urethra cleaning solution. Those are all very drying. They can make the urethra very dry because a little bit of that fluid is going to slip in there, dry out that moist uh, tissue that should be there. And then you're going to end up with some cracks in the tissue, which is just infection to bacteria. So be sure you lubricate the catheter well. Uh, clean the urethra from a front to back motion if you're male or female. Then use a different part of your washcloth or your uh, cleaner that you, your cloth that you're using. Wash it from the front to back. Remove the cloth from the area and wash it from top to bottom, front to back. Don't scrub back and forth. That's taking bacteria, bringing it up, taking bacteria, bringing it down, bringing it up. So sometimes when people scrub, 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 scrub to be extra clean, they're actually making things worse. One swipe, use a different part of the cloth, one swipe. When you're finished, rinse your urethra because if the soap or the cleaner stays on there, again, it's very drying and it's an invitation. So that would be uh, something to do. Um, this person's had a urodynamic testing and bladder scope and all these different things. So uh, her question actually comes down to, uh, and she's been wearing gloves too, which is sometimes people who have recurrent infections, a good thing. Uh, what it comes down to is she's wondering, should she be taking a daily dose of long-term antibiotics, which has been offered, or she, should she just stick with her Bactrim uh, once a month. And so that is a huge question because sometimes the daily dose is a lower amount. Whereas the, if you're taking the going on antibiotic treatment for a course every month, you're getting a higher dosage. So talk to your healthcare professional about what they're recommending and why they're recommending it. Um, some people do better with, the, with taking the antibiotic treatment. Some people do better with the lower dose. Now, why is that? Because after spinal cord injury, people have um, effects to their autonomic nerve system, nervous system, as you all know. That's what causes uh, spasticity. That's what causes uh, temperature dysregulation. Um, that's what causes um, autonomic dysreflexia. But it also 
causes the um, immune system to not work so well. So your immune system might not work at all, which then people tend to have more infections. Um, your immune system might be working a little bit, but maybe not fast enough, or it, it could just be pokey. So, uh, or it might be not recognizing that bacteria is there. So those are some of the issues. It's probably more an issue, and we don't know who has the healthy immune system and who has a an, an not quite so compliant immune system. So that's probably the issue. Now, um, a while back, I thought I issued a call to researchers, please. We're looking at the target. We're looking at how to treat spasticity. That's a looking at the target. We're looking at how to treat autonomic dysreflexia, looking at the target. Let's look at the cause, look at the autonomic nervous system. And there are people that are starting to do that now because if you can fix the autonomic, autonomic nervous system, you can, you can, or at least improve it, you can improve all these problems with one fell swoop. So, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that, you know, people are starting to take notice and they're doing a really good job on working on those things. Um, so, you know, it's an, it's an evolution of thought as we go along through this whole process. Here's a person who has a super pubic calf wondering why I have a slower urine flow with my leg bag than the bag, bed bag. It could be positioning when your leg bag are you sitting up and when you have your bed bag, you're laying down. So it could be a positioning kind of thing, although gravity sitting up usually helps flow much better. Um, it could be the size of the connector. If you have to use different connectors, sometimes um, things don't fit together and you have to use a connect connector that has a smaller opening in one or the other. Or um, it could be because... Um, when you're in bed and you're using the leg bag, your legs go up and so you're putting off all that urine. It could be a variety of things, but as long as the urine is coming out, you're doing okay. Also, the leg bag is smaller than the, the, um, the leg bag is smaller than the bed bag. So just the fact that you have less room in the leg bag might be slowing things down or it could be maybe um, you, you don't have the tubing connected. Uh, so men and women should always have the catheter tubing taped up to their abdomen because even though that makes you think, well, why would I take it up? And then the urine has to go like that. Where the bladder is, it really, it really doesn't go like that. So taping it up, that always helps. If you um, take the uh, tape the catheter, sometimes ladies can take the tape the catheter to their inner thigh which is fine because of the anatomy there, but uh, sometimes that helps too. Um, but, um, oh, I kind of lost my train of thought because I'm, I'm just curious about this leg bag thing, but sometimes it can be how the tubing is positioned. So at night, if you have a leg bag, you always want to leave the tubing in a curl up on the bed, you don't want any dependent loops going over the side of the bed because you know that tubing can be quite long. So you don't want that dependent loop because that's harder for gravity to then go up into the leg bag if the tubing goes lower than the leg bag. So there's all kinds of placement kind of issues there. I don't think it's really anything to worry about as long as the urine is coming out, you're not having any leaking, it's probably okay. Uh, do I know of any clinical trials in the near future? Well, there are many clinical trials on a variety of subjects. The best place to go to find out about them is clinical trials, one word, clinicaltrials.gov. Then you go, when you get on the site, you type in whatever you're interested in. If it's neurogenic bladder, neurogenic bowel, spasticity after spinal cord injury, you can type in spinal cord injury. Any clinical trial that has any kind of federal funding, which is just about all of them, um, unless it's industry sponsor, will be listed on that site. Now, if this, there's a clinical trial that's happening in Rhode Island and you live in California, there's no way I can participate. It's still a great site because they have to um, post what their trial is and why they're doing it, what the evidence is that su suggests that this works. Um, whatever they're trying. And then they have to post a follow-up that says, this is the outcome of our study. And they have to do it in real people language, which is lovely. And so if you look at that, you can get ideas. So when you go to your healthcare professional, 
there's this trial going on in Rhode Island. I can't get there, but I see they're doing this. What are your thoughts about would this work for me? And see if you can't become involved with your own healthcare professional in uh, doing, doing, getting involved uh, with that, that sort of treatment. So it's a very good site because it gets you thinking about kinds of things. Sometimes they're taking, giving people a supplement. Um, so talk to your, you never want to take anything without talking to your healthcare provider because their interactions with medications, with other supplements, with foods, there's always interactions. They go into the computer, they type it in. Oh no, that has no interaction that should be safe for you. Or maybe there's something in your medical condition. So before you take anything in your mouth, inhale it, rub it on your skin, inject anything that you put into your body in any way, shape or form. Always check with your healthcare professional to make sure that's okay. Uh, pregnancy is the question. So I'm just gonna answer this uh, generally. Um, if you are pregnant, you might have more risk of urinary tract infection, or you might have to empty your bladder more frequently because of the pressure of the weight. Can you get pregnant after spinal cord injury? Absolutely, you can. Um, and if you're a man, you can get somebody pregnant. Now, sometimes you might have to um, uh, retrieve the sperm or sometimes a woman might have to have um, artificial insemination, but uh, sure, you can have it and you can have a normal delivery. Um, you know, you just have to take precautions. Uh, sometimes for a while they said, well, you don't feel below your waist, you won't feel labor, so we won't give you any medication for it. Oh, but your body does. Your body responds anyway. So you need to have full medication. That's a, a big thing is to be sure that you have yourself correctly taken care of. So a uh, suprapubic versus a urethral catheter. Um, which one is the better choice? If you have a um, high pressure bladder, the suprapubic or the sphincterotomy with an external flexion device if you're a male. If you have a high pressure bladder and you're a female, you need to have an indwelling or you need to do something like the mitral fan off. You can do intermittent catheterization, but you have to be very vigilant about it. You can't um, you know, like miss the cath in time, or you can't mess up your fluids because of the pressure. So uh, you can do intermittent catheterization, but you have to really watch out for it. Uh, Superpubic uh, is an easier risk. There is a study, I just read this study, that the suprapubic catheter risk of infection is exactly the same as an indwelling catheter and not that much different from intermittent catheterization. So it's nothing to be afraid of. You just have to know how to care for it and do that. So uh, which is the better choice? Well, you know, I think the better choice is the one that's what that works for you. Um, here's a person that says they're a nurse on a spinal cord um, unit and having um, patients who are thinking of baby, is there any uh, newer resources that might be uh, better? And yes, uh, I think, um, Beth, I think I'm going to refer this to you. I think you have something about pregnancy at the ReFoundation. So um, that would be a good place to go. I'm not, I, think, I think I've seen something there. So that's probably the best place to go. Yes. Um, we, we have a fact sheet on pregnancy for women. There you, you go. Request it. Okay. So that would, be, that would be a great place to start. Uh, I think on the right. Okay, I want to know if uh, it rehab programs for SDI. Well, the, um, there are several major rehab programs for spinal cord injury, which um, the two um, biggest ones that, that are dedicated to spinal cord injury and brain injury is Craig in Denver and uh, the Shepherd Center in Atlanta. But there are other places as well that are uh, pretty dynamic. So, um, you know, there's Shirley Ryan in Chicago, there's Baylor in Texas, there's the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, what you want to do is you want to look for a place that has a rehab program specific to spinal cord injury. And so that would be the best option for that. Um, this person, this next person is changing an indwelling catheter more than four times a month because of blockage and um, it's her son and he's his only caretaker. 
uh, they don't live together, so it's an emergency situation. Yes, and that is too much dysreflexia and too much catheter changing. Well, some people change every week, um, so that's not that unusual. But since you're having all this blockage, something is wrong um, in the bladder that's causing um, this dysfunction. So if he hasn't had a urodynamic testing, you need to have that. You need to talk to your healthcare professional about some kind of kind of control um, for the dysreflexia to be treated at home. So some people treat that at home, change the catheter, and then everything, you know, turns out. You don't want to be running into these emergency events every week because, my goodness, that's, that's quite a toll on the quality of life. So get your dynamic testing, find out what's going on. It could just be that that bladder is contracting. It could be to spasms. And there, you know, it's an easy fix. Um, well, I, I should say it's one of the easier things to do. Nothing is ever that easy in healthcare, is it? But that, that is a treatable problem. So that should be uh, taken care of. This next person's coming home on a ventilator and what's a great VNA company to go with in Boston, Massachusetts. The greatest company to go to is the one that you are comfortable with. If you're still in the facility, you can check with your health insurance, see which companies they uh, fund, if they're going to fund it, and then call those companies and interview people. Have somebody come to the facility and talk to you about what services they provide. Have them talk to you about what are you gonna do if somebody doesn't show up? What are you gonna do? Uh, how are they gonna handle it if you don't hit it off with the person that they send? So be sure interview them because you're hiring them for a job. It doesn't matter if you're insured, paying for it or if somebody else is paying, or if you're paying for it out of pocket, you're hiring somebody for a job. So interview people because some people are going to like some companies and other people are going to like people from other companies. So it's really a matter of personal choice as far as that goes. You want your needs met, but it really comes down to personal choice. Okay, so here's the question about the COVID. <clears throat> do they do better or worse than the general population with a vaccine? Well, nobody knows that because there hasn't been enough uh, data collected. So <clears throat> now we have a new one. I'm, excuse me, I'm going to have to take a little tickle. I apologize for that. So, uh, but there are things that's important for people with spinal cord injury once you get the vaccine. There's a place on the CDC website um, called, um, um, now let me see, VSAFE. It's called VSAFE. And you put in your information, if you had it, this is the way they're collecting data on everyone. But you can denote that your spinal cord injured. You can also uh, report anecdotally to the Christopher Reeve Foundation. They're collecting information about that as well. So um, that's an important, uh, that's important pieces of information. My concern about it is um, if, you, if you have a lower level injury, they give it to you in arm. It's given intermuscularly, so you can get it in any muscle in the body, but the CDC guidelines say to give it up in the shoulder. So that's where they're going to give it because that's the guideline. Could you have it in the back pocket, the hip pocket, as they say? Of course you could. Could you have it in the thigh? Of course you could. But the guidelines say in the arms, so that's where they're going to give it. So now if you have a lower level injury, you're going, to, you're going to feel it and you're going to exercise your arm and you're probably not going to have any problem. If you have a higher level injury, you could have autonomic dysreflexia, not necessarily from the shot, but just because there's fluid and you know when a needle goes in your arm, it smarts a little bit. It doesn't really hurt, but it smarts a little bit. And then there's that little bolus of fluid in there until it dissipates. You'll need somebody to move your arm for you if you can't exercise your arm to get that fluid down. So you want to think about AD and be prepared for that. You want to think about your spasticity might increase. You want to prepare for that. Um, if you are anybody, spinal cord injured or not, and you have uh, allergic reactions easily, and you carry an anaphylaxis pen, you'll want to have that with you. They do have a 15 minute recovery period. They call it recovery period, where you just sit and you're monitored. If nothing happens in those 15 minutes, probably nothing is going to happen to you. 
Um, so they do make you sit there and, and wait and see how things go. Um, if you want to sit there a few minutes longer, if you want to stay 30 minutes, fine. They, nobody, nobody comes up to you and says, got to get out. You know, we got it, the next guy coming in. Uh, so that's uh, something else to think about. Um, there's another thing, um, epidural. Um, somebody wants to know about epidural stimulation. And this is, a, this is the, the new thing, and it's really having a lot of success. You can have it epidurally stimulated by having electrodes placed on the skin, or you can have it um, by electrode implants. With a, They're having a lot of success uh, with function and sensation return with these. They're still under study for the implants, but the, the amount that they can give out about the study is like, it's, it's just doing really well with a lot more functionalities than they had anticipated. Um, some side treat, some side uh, secondary conditions with a resolution. So uh, not every insurance pays for this, but it's rapidly improving and uh, becoming more state of the art. So we are going to see prices come down. We're gonna see more and more uh, supplemental about this. Um, you can have epidural stimulation for just bowel and bladder, um, which is very nice. If you have a lower level injury, there are implants that you can have uh, put in that gives you uh, uh, bowel function at the touch of a button, bladder function at the touch of a button, um, and uh, sexual function in men, not in women, but in men. Um, so, you know, we just, we just have to see, we have to see how all of that is uh, going. Uh, we have somebody else who wrote in about Abbott Northwest SCI Rehab in Midwest. That's, that's another one. Uh, Sister Kenny, yeah, there are all these wonderful uh, places. I mean, we could have a whole session on all these places to go. So that's good. Um, Let's see, um, I urinate all night long, no diabetes, but t uh, people tell me I'm fine. I tell them no, advice please. So if you're urinating all night long, um, if you have a catheter in dwelling, urine is produced all the time. So yes, you're gonna urinate all night long. If you uh, have edema and that's being returned, it's gonna feel like you're having more urination because you're now getting rid of that fluid. Uh, that's collected through the day. If you have to get up and, and go to toilet more, um, that sometimes happens with people, again, for the bladder contraction reason, reasoning. So if you have a spinal cord injury and you're having problems with increased urination at night and it can't be explained by one of the simpler reasons, be sure and get, um, be sure and get some information from uh, your healthcare professional and maybe a urodynamics test. Um, that would be an important thing to help find out what the cause of this is for you. Um, so there's uh, some questions here uh, in the, I didn't get as far as I had anticipated. Um, so I apologize for that on the pre questions, but there's some in the chat box. So I wanna be sure and get those. Um, there's a person with an incomplete T45 and flattened spinal cord 42 years ago. Another great survivor story. I've had about five or six year dynamic studies in 20 years, all showing absent neural connection. Uh, hypertonicity in my legs with flaccid bladder blouse. This combination possible? Absolutely. It's what we call mixed bladder. So if you have uh, a lot of tone in your legs, you could be having a uh, tone in your bladder. Maybe you didn't before in these urodynamic st st studies, but maybe you are now. Usually what we see on the outside is what's going on on the inside. Um, so it could be that you're having some tone in your bladder or in the sphincter of your bladder. Um, but sometimes people have what they call a mix. They have an upper motor and a lower motor all mixed together. That's when it's really important to get that urodynamic testing again to see exactly what's going on there. Um, there's a question about skin. If I put pressure on it anywhere, it turns red, the redness goes away. I'm mostly worried about the coccyx and the back and what I can do about it because they lay for about four hours when I turn, but there's redness and it will go away. I didn't have this problem before. Well, 
Our bodies change at all times. Pardon me again. So if you're having redness from sitting or laying, I would question my uh, pressure dispersing equipment because if it's turning red that quickly, um, it's not doing its job. So you might need some new equipment. Maybe your equipment's just gotten old and it's not working up to performance. Or maybe you need some more, um, uh, uh, I'm gonna call it higher strength, but a, a higher level of equipment to reduce that. Even though you're on equipment, you still need to turn. Maybe four hours is too long to go. Maybe you need to turn every two hours. Um, and you need to do your pressure releases at least every 15 minutes when you're sitting. And that should help that redness go away. Should never rub the redness. You should stay off of it until the redness does go away. But my guess is maybe I would look at my pressure dispersing equipment um, there's no equipment in the world that can absolutely re, uh, take away the risk of <clears throat> pressure injury. You have to be, you have to do the uh, pressure releases. That's just the way that that is. So uh, look at that equipment and see as we get older, our bodies all change. So sometimes it may be that you need to uh, upgrade that equipment a little bit. <clears throat> can the size of a suprapubic catheter uh, be reduced? Um, yes, it can be. Uh, you'll want to, you'll want to, uh, is a 22 French the largest size? No, it is not. You can, there are 30 is uh, considered a large size and you can even go up even, uh, even larger than that. Um, <clears throat> but it can be sometimes that opening at the sphincter gets dilated because of the tube that's going in there. I mean, that's that's the point. You want the skin to heal up to the catheter, but not larger than that. But if the catheter is being pulled or uh, sometimes people have a little bit of a uh, open area along the edge and so they start packing it and that stretches um, the size of the, uh, the cath uh, the opening. So you can take it very slowly and it can, if the, if the stoma, the opening is well healed, it's probably not going to shrink down any, uh, you know, and then you'll probably have some leakage, but oftentimes you can, and it just depends on, uh, it just depends on, uh, uh, how, how well healed that stoma is. Uh, so there's a next question. Is there any type of lotion I should use on my genitals after catheting? Uh, yes, the type that you should use is none. Um, lotion tends to breed, um, even though you might not sweat after spinal cord injury, in the area of your groin, it's a warm, dark, moist place. That tends to um, breed bacteria. So you want to keep that area as clean and as dry as possible. So you don't want necessarily lotion to be put there. It might moisten the skin, but um, what's going to happen is that it's going to breed a lot more bacteria there. So I would not recommend doing that. Um, if you want to, um, uh, it's always good to uh, do frog legs to kind of air out that area to keep it because you want to keep it clean and dry. So that's what you really want to have in that particular spot. Um, here's a person with uh, frequent UTIs and he's been on um, uh, the mandelamine and vitamin C for a year and that seems to work. Recently he started with UTIs again. He's now uh, suggesting low level macrodantin are the downsides to being on uh, antibiotics all the time. And uh, he's had an incomplete spinal cord TBI and strokes in a multiple vehicle accident. So um, again, it's down to that question of, should you be on low level antibiotics or all the time or not? So I would follow uh, the advice of, um, of your healthcare professional who knows what's going on best. Um, so he's already been on uh, treatment, which is low level antibiotics. Um, with the vitamin C and the mandelamine. So, uh, it, you know, that just might be the next step up. So, um, you know, it's certainly uh, your choice. Um, you know, you can, you can 
just check with your healthcare professional if that's what they're recommending or asking if there's anything else that you can possibly try to see um, if there's, you know, um, the low level antibiotics are so low level. It does affect a little bit of resistance, but it probably, it doesn't affect that much that you can still go on a higher level antibiotic uh, later on if you do have a breakthrough infection. Okay, and the most important question here is on here, and this one is really uh, significant, and I always like to mention this because I'm always asked, I have a spinal cord injury, I want to get my vaccine, um, you know, how do I qualify for that? Well, this is the absolute truth, and I know a lot of people, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to cheat, or I don't want to this. No, you don't have to cheat. Um, when you have a spinal cord injury, your autonomic nervous system is affected, you are immunocompromised. Now, is it really horribly affected or not so much affected? Well, we don't know. But if you have spinal cord injury or if you have um, any other neurological uh, issue, you are immunocompromised. Check box, you're in box. You are, if you're over 75, you're in group 1B. If you're 65 or older, you're in group 1C, or anybody who has immunocompromised, that is spinal cord injury, uh, brain injury, um, any uh, medical condition that affects your nervous system, you classify as immunocompromised, so you're in group 1C um, by the CDC guidelines. Your state guidelines will be different, but you're still in like the first groups, so be sure and mark that. If you have um, a spinal cord injury, you yes, that includes people with spina bifida. Yes, it does. If you have um, any kind of spinal cord injury, your respiratory system is affected because it takes three muscles to breathe. It takes the diaphragm to move. So even if that is not affected, it takes the intercostal muscles, which are the little muscles in between the ribs, which pulls the lungs out this way, the diaphragm pulls it this way, intercostals pull the lungs this way. Um, those may or may not be infected, but no affected, but no matter what, the abdominal muscles are affected. And that's the third uh, set of muscles that it takes to breathe. There's a lot to breathing, but if you have a spinal cord injury, you can check the box for respiratory compromise. So you have at least two, no matter what, you have at least two things to get you up into the C group. Um, the other things you may have diabetes with spinal cord injuries, a secondary complication. And so, um, um, you know, th these kinds of things are, are unfortunate, but they are a part of spinal cord injury. So in this case, it's going to work to your advantage. So you're not cheating. You're not jumping the line. You're reporting what is fact. And, uh, you know, you move forward with that. So yes, having a spinal cord injury definitely moves you, moves you up. Um, we don't think of people with spinal cord injury as being unwell, but you do have high risk conditions that could affect you. Um, so yes, and, you know, getting the COVID is very dangerous for somebody with spinal cord injury. So getting the vaccine will be very helpful. That is up to your own personal choices and beliefs about the vaccine. I know some people don't want to have it, but it certainly will work in your favor. And with that, we are at the top of the hour. So I appreciate everybody coming today. It's been a wonderful session. And uh, next month, we're going to be talking about bowel, uh, neurogenic bowel. So let's do that. One more thing I want to say is I'm trying to collect ideas from people things that you have learned because you're doing this all the time. Um, I'm trying to get 101 ideas of something that, you know, that you're doing that's unique to you or it's something that you've discovered along the way that we can share this with everybody. Not that everybody's going to do 101 things, but maybe somebody will read that and say, hey, that is just the thing that I need to try. So um, if you would mind, if you submit it, um, on the community and the Nurse Linda section. I'm gonna to try to collect those. When I get a bunch of them, we're gonna publish that and put that out. So um, I look forward to seeing you all next week and it was nice spending this hour with you. Have a good week.